Hello friends, this is Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm back with another weekly video just kind of recapping everything that we were able to accomplish on the homestead this week. We're going to do some fun preservation projects. I'm going to show you how I was able to make some wild crab apple jelly without using any pectin. If you do not like to use boxed pectin from the grocery store, this will show you how you're able to accomplish that and still get your jelly to gel. We also have a couple other simple preservation projects I'm just going to briefly touch on and then just talk about this season of life on the homestead and all of the other things that are going on. So first we're just collecting some eggs for breakfast in this beautiful morning here on the homestead. Why don't we talk about how our week started? We always like to start our week together as a family, worshiping the Lord. We sit around the table together, have some good conversation. Everybody grabs a cup of hot tea or hot coffee, whatever they like to drink, and we prepare to have our worship time together. Adam always picks a selection to read from and study from. He gives us his um, take on that selection and asks us questions and um, we just worship together, sing some songs, and like to start our week in that way. And then, of course, our weekends are also full with a little bit of winter prep. It is that time of year. The temperature dropped pretty significantly at the beginning of the week, and the nighttime temps were reaching into the low 40s, which um, it's that time of year, I guess. And then towards the end of the week, the temperature popped back up, up into the 80s, during the day. So we're at that time of year where we need to prepare for winter, but it's not quite here yet. The weather is still warm enough for us to be outdoors comfortably accomplishing tasks. And we're getting there with our wood collection. We need five cords of wood saved up, stacked up, and split to get us through the winter since we heat exclusively with wood. And I would say we have about another month or so before we will even start really using the wood stove through the evening. So happy to be prepared for that. Miss Grace and I were taking a walk through the property and we noticed that the crab apples were ripe and I had forgotten that we had a crab apple tree back on the corner of our property. We used to have this huge crab apple tree that produced really large crab apples, the kind of larger sour green ones. And we had a late frost one year as the blossoms on that tree, the, the tree was full of blossoms. And when it frosted overnight, the weight of those frozen blossoms snapped the tree in half and we lost it. So at this point, we have several smaller crab apple trees that just produce these teeny tiny crab apples that are red that are almost the size of maybe a cherry. And so we're going to go ahead and harvest some of those. I'm grateful to have Gracie's help here. She can climb the tree for me and get the ones that are up high. She enjoys doing that kind of activity, so I'm grateful to have her around. And once we were able to harvest enough for one small batch of jelly, we just had to go through and pick all of the leaves out so that just the crab apples were left behind. And this is our little bowl here, what we were able to forage for, and I think that this will make a nice little batch of jelly. I brought them inside and washed them, and then I'm just taking an opportunity here to pull off the stems. It's it's not necessary to remove the stems, but it's giving me an opportunity to look at each one and get rid of any that had bug spots or rotten spots in them. So I'm um, just making sure to do that. Now crab apples, apples in particular, are very high in natural pectin. And pectin is what you typically add to your jams and jellies to help get it to set into that firm, you know, jelly texture. So the great thing about making crab apple jelly is that I don't need to add pectin to this. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to make jelly out of these. Crab apples are not a type of apple that you really want to eat raw. They are very bitter, very sour. And so they're really only good for making jelly. And because of that pectin, they make a wonderful jelly. I look forward to doing this every year. So there is no need to cut these in half. Once I get my bowl full of, or my pot full of all of these crab apples, I'm gonna fill it with some water and just get it on the stove. And we're gonna let these simmer all morning long while we're doing our schoolwork. 
So they're just kind of on a medium heat, just simmering away. We want all of those apples to cook down and kind of break apart and release all of that natural pectin. The next thing I'm going to do is strain out the solids just to leave the juice behind. And I did not have any jelly cloth or jelly bags to run this through. So I'm using a tea strainer that had small enough holes that it would leave the solids behind. I did not want to make a jam out of these crab apples because these apples are pretty broken down and it would almost be an applesauce texture at this point. It wouldn't be a jam. It would be more like an apple butter and that isn't what I'm looking for out of this. So I am straining all of the solids through that tea strainer just to have some juice left behind. Now when I am making jelly without pectin, I don't need to be as careful about measuring the amounts of juice that a specific pectin recipe would call for. What I typically do is eyeball it and I add on a one-to-one -one ratio the same amount of sugar um, as juice. So um, if I have, let's say, five cups of juice, I'll add five cups of sugar to it. Then we're going to put that back on the stove and we're just going to bring it to a hard boil and let that boil down. And that sugar combined with the pectin in the apple will help um, thicken this up and get this to gel into that jelly texture. Once I'm um, convinced that it has gelled to the appropriate texture, and you can see it's very thick and syrupy at this point, I'm going to fill my little half pint jars here. We're going to get these canned up in the water bath canner we process our jelly for 10 minutes. And it really is that simple. And this is going to gel without adding any of that boxed pectin or calcium water or anything else that you need to add to other types of jellies. As always, that sticky texture, we don't want any of that left on the rims of these jars or it's going to affect the seals of our canned items here using my four jars canning lids. If you want 10% off some canning lids for yourself, check out the link in the video description and use my code and you can get some too. So once we get these rings on, we're gonna water bath can them for 10 minutes and then we're gonna have some beautiful crab apple jelly that was essentially just free, only the cost of the sugar. So very excited to add that to the pantry shelves. Just wanted to show you the texture of how that turns out. You can see it's spreadable and thick. It's not completely solid, but it is that sort of jelly texture that works really well. It is apple season, so we'll be going to Adam's grandpa's old orchard here this weekend, and we will be doing a lot more apple preserving in the coming weeks. For now, our preservation efforts are mostly just coming from these tiny little harvests that we're able to still pull out of the garden. At this point, we really only have okra, some tomatoes and peppers, some herbs, celery, um, lots of greens like kale, um, things like that that are growing in the garden. A lot of root veggies that won't be ready until closer to our first frost next month. Um, and so not a lot of big batch canning that can be done besides tomatoes. But there are a lot of little batches that can be put in the freeze dryer. So I'm just getting my freeze dryer cleaned up and ready to fill with whatever we're able to harvest on this day. Little Benjamin decided to follow me out to the garden and be my helper. We are harvesting rosemary here. Over the month of August, I was so busy doing a lot of the bigger, more intensive preservation projects um, that require canning and things like that, that my herbs were very neglected. I, I failed to harvest herbs as well as I should. So we harvested some rosemary, some lavender, and we're gonna do some basil. And then I have this big bed of celery here. We had done a little bit of celery in the month of August. I had freeze dried some, I had pickled some celery, um, but we have a lot of regrowth that's coming in and some even of the original plants that have never been harvested that just need to be cut back and I need to do something with them before they get really bitter. So we're gonna take them inside and we're gonna freeze dry another batch to either make celery salt or just for future batches of broth and other soups that we wanna use the celery in. Here's that basil that I was talking about. I had a little bit that was growing in my green stalk. It smells amazing. We're just gonna grab some of that and then I'm gonna bring it inside, get it all organized and washed up 
and then we're going to get this into the freeze dryer. A lot of people ask me, why on earth would you use the electricity and bother to freeze dry things like herbs that you could just hang to dry and allow them to be preserved in that way? And the reason is because I do find that freeze drying produces a more fragrant um, and and the color retention is much better in the, the end result. When I hang things to dry, I feel like the light and the time it takes to dry, some of the scent and the flavor in the herbs definitely disappears over the drying time, whereas I feel like the freeze dryer really kind of like flash freezes that and preserves it really well. The color as well remains just as vibrant when you freeze dry it as it is when it is raw. Um, so I just really think it gives me a superior product that I'm happy with. And it doesn't take very long. I can put all of these items in the freeze dryer. I know the celery, um, even the stalks are a little thicker than the leaves of the herbs. And between this celery and the herbs, it only took about 11 or maybe 12 hours to complete a freeze dried batch. And I do that know that I have looked into it before. My freeze dryer costs approximately three dollars per day to run it if it were running for a full 24-hour cycle it might cost me about three dollars in electricity just kind of depending on what the cost of electricity is at the time and so you figure for 12 hours it's a dollar fifty to freeze dry the herbs it's done we have optimal color retention flavor retention i just really feel like it's a superior um, way to preserve these items. Now, all of the leftover celery greens that I had that didn't fit into the freeze dryer, I went ahead and put in the freezer for other future batches of broth. So we ended up with one tray of the herbs, two trays of the celery stalks, and one tray of celery greens headed into the freeze dryer. Um, we're going to go ahead and little Benjamin here wanted to press the button for me. We have to make sure the drain valve is shut off before we get that started. And then we will see that in 12 hours. And this is what it looked like. So I am at this point, anything that comes in from the garden that I'm freeze drying, I'm pretty much packaging it all up into mylar. And that is because I'm running really low on canning jars. I've canned a little more than I did Last year, last year, I put a lot of my freeze-dried items in canning jars, but I can't do that this year because I need all of my jars for canning purposes unless I want to go out and purchase more canning jars. But the great thing about putting the freeze-dried food into mylar versus just vacuum sealing it into a canning jar is that um, no light can get into these bags. The color will be retained even better. Um, these are going to be great for gifting if I wanted to. I can put these away. They'll be good for 25 years in storage. And if there's ever a year in the future where I do not um, grow celery, for example, I will have these bags to use during those years. That will be a huge blessing. The lavender that I put into mylar will likely be used for soap making uh, at some point this winter. I do like to make my own bar soap and I don't know when I'm going to get to that. So just putting that away in mylar for the, the, op the first opportunity I'll get to do that here in the future. Using a hair straightener to seal off those mylar bags, that works great. And then once we have them all sealed, they have their oxygen absorber inside, we'll take those down to the root cellar and those will go into our long-term food storage and will be good for 20 plus years. So the food preservation season is really beginning to slow down because I am so busy with the kids' school now. Our school takes up the majority of um, our mornings during the weekdays and that is time during the summer when we weren't doing school that I would have been doing preservation projects. So any preserving that I'm going to do at this point needs to fit into the afternoon while my little ones are napping or on the weekends if I have a chance. But at this point, there really isn't that much more canning to be done. I'm freezing tomatoes as I'm showing you here as they come in. And then any ripe ones that are that I have fresh that are sitting on the table, I'll just dump everything into a roaster, cook it down and can up some sauce or some tomato paste or even tomato juice, whatever you know I have the energy to do on that day. And I'm just slowly doing small batches of that as the tomatoes come in. Same thing with peppers. I'm doing little batches of pickled peppers or pickled okra and stuff like that. But beyond that, I might can 
a couple more batches of kale from the garden. I'll probably can some batches of butternut squash and pumpkin to have on the shelves. And then um, Concord grapes are the last large project that I will do this year, typically in the beginning of October. And we will make grape juice, grape jelly, um, grape pie filling, all sorts of things like that. If I have energy, I will get to doing some more apples. I'd like to do some more apple pie filling and maybe, maybe some applesauce. But I did so many in the month of August that I really don't need to preserve any apple products. That's just uh, if I have the time and energy to do it. Using my roaster for canning at this point of my life is such a blessing. I'm able to get all the food in the roaster early in the morning while we're doing school, it all cooks down. And then by the end of my lessons, I can just hit everything with an immersion blender that's in the roaster, cook it down maybe a little longer to whatever desired thickness. And it is just a super easy way to preserve tomatoes um, for a busy homeschool mom that can't be in the kitchen while she needs to be teaching her school lessons. And this is exactly why I run the Every Bit Counts Challenge in the month of August that you guys saw me do last month in my YouTube videos. It's because as a busy mom, you really rarely have the time to devote to all-day canning projects. I don't have five or six hours to just do a marathon canning all day long. I have to fit whatever projects I'm doing into little pockets of time here and there throughout the day, even spread out throughout the week. And so this is the way I'm able to accomplish that. I'm grateful for all of these handy tools like my roaster and like the freeze dryer and my dehydrator and even the freezers that allow me to freeze the tomatoes and things. It really does make it easier to get all of the harvest preserved up so that we can enjoy them this winter. And that is definitely the focus this time of year. We are in winter prep mode. And I know that technically it is the beginning of fall, but when you're a homesteader, seasons are defined differently. For me, winter is begins as soon as we light the wood stove and we move into that season where nothing is growing outdoors. Spring begins as soon as I can get into the garden and start working there. Fall begins as soon as we start bringing in the harvests and doing canning work. And so we, you know, our seasons are defined a little differently. And I am definitely, I feel like even though fall is technically starting for other people, fall is beginning to wind down for us here. The harvest season is beginning to wind down. We just have a few more projects to do, but we are at this point less than a month away from our first frost date. Things will stop growing here and we are just going to light up that wood stove, curl up with a book and a blanket indoors and enjoy the fruits of all of our labor this year. There won't be the work to do outdoors. We can just focus on kitchen projects and baking and doing wonderful meals and things and that is what I hope to really bring you along for for my videos during this next season of life. In the meantime the family is trying to soak up these last days of sunshine get in some outdoor play and really just enjoy this weather while it lasts because we are not that far away from frosty coldy wintry mornings here in Northwest Ohio. As that food preservation season is winding down, I hope that you will drop a comment here on this video and let me know what types of content you would like to see throughout these winter months when I have a little more time to experiment in my kitchen. Do you want to see more baking videos? Do you want to see meal videos? Do you want to see more dairy-free cheeses and things like that, more information on homeschooling, let me know what type of content you're interested in and we will do our best to show you. So this is little Miss Hannah. She is now nine months old and almost ready to walk. Time is flying, you guys. And speaking of time flying, <laughs> I'm sure the next week is going to fly by and then we will be back with another video. Until then, I hope you're blessed, friends. Bye.